bring our joy to life. We won't submit to sorrow. Our joy is coming in the morning. In the morning. Come on, sing it with me. See your love. Your light can drown our darkness and bring our joy to life. We won't submit to sorrow. Our joy is coming in the morning. Today, somebody make a joyful noise. Somebody try again, make a joyful noise. That sounds good. Nobody should leave the house of God today without joy coming out of you, without joy being present in your conversation, the expressions on your face, your spirit should reek of joy. Somebody one more time, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. There's something good in the atmosphere today. There's something available for somebody to reach out and grab. I I'm gonna make you do a silly little exercise. Some of y'all are gonna hate me for this, but I promise you, you're gonna turn around in a moment. Usually this is a spot where we get you to look around, find somebody and greet them and make them feel welcome in the place. And that's what we're gonna do in a second. But first, I want you to look at the person beside you. That's right. 
And I don't want you to say hello. I don't want you to ask them how they're doing. What I want you to do, science has proven that if you fake laugh for just long enough, you cannot help all of a sudden your body gets tricked into releasing endorphins and it actually makes you feel better so i want you to look at somebody's face and i want you to fake laugh right in their face until it suddenly turns serious Why, why'd y'all turn into genuine smiles all of a sudden? A lot of you are grinning and I don't think you're faking it. That's how you should feel every time you leave the house of God. There should be joy pouring out of your soul. We are joyful in the house of the Most High God. All right, now, now you can find somebody and greet them in the name of Jesus. Make our guests feel especially welcome today. made it clear at the beginning of first word that we are so grateful for everything that God did in our young people and the people that worked at Youth Congress. We are so grateful for, look, I know a lot of people made some sacrifices in order to get these young people to Youth Congress. I want to thank you from the bottom of our heart together for making that investment because every bit of it was worth it. There was a lot that was done. Jenna received the Holy Ghost. What was it Friday night? So we have one of our own, get the Holy Ghost, the last service at Youth Congress. That alone is worth the investment for us. Y'all, is this water bottle possessed by the devil or something? Because it's been flopping all over the altar. If somebody can grab that water bottle for me and lock it up somewhere, we'd be very appreciative of that. What, well, I forgot what I was going to say now. I will we'll get it later. I do want to say one thing. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to every single person that lingered in the altar and lingered in the house of God last Sunday. And also thank you for what was accomplished Sunday night at our first 318 worship night. Did y'all enjoy that? Y'all, the group that took part in getting that ready for us, thank you all so very, very much for doing that. I believe that God has great things in store for those nights and that was a great way to start it off. Today, I only have two quick announcements to make. Number one, uh, this evening at 5.30, we have rented out, Rock has rented out specifically, has rented out the uh, Hot Wheels skating rink over in Bossier City here. They've rented out for y'all. So what we're going to do, the first, uh, admission is free, but the first 100 kids that make their way to Hot Wheels get free skates as well. So you have a little extra incentive to be right on time at 5.30 this evening, 5.30. We want you to come. It's going to be a great time. You talk about joy. There's going to be a lot of joy on that rink as those kids fly around with such dexterity and grace. It's going to be amazing. But also, uh, some of you parents as well. Some of y'all, y'all love Hot Wheels because as soon as some of you people that grew up about 1988, 1993, y'all go out there and all of a sudden y'all are like, who was that who was that ice skater apollo ono or whatever you are flying around there with perfect form the legs sweeping out behind you reliving the glory days and your kids are just so they're so impressed by us and so it's uh it's a it's a wonderful thing for our families y'all be sure to be a part of that and also invite somebody to come with us it's going to be a great chance for a fellowship and to reach out to somebody else if the ushers would help us to prepare to take the offering i've only got one more announcement next sunday is our back to school sunday all students, doesn't matter how old you are, all students, we would encourage you to bring your backpack to the church during the service for the upcoming school year. Why are we doing that? We like to pray over a prayer cloth, and we like to place that in the backpacks of all of our students because we believe that they are missionaries. Wherever they go to school, they are a little demonstration of the glory of God in that school. So we're going to pray over all of our children. We're going to pray over those backpacks for their safety, for their education, for their future, that God would use them as, again, a little missionary all across this region. Can y'all get on board with that? 
Amen. Popsicles and fellowship is going to be following service on the front portico. So we're going to have a little fun after that service. But right now we're going to go back into worship and invite the presence of God to have his perfect will. Father, we glorify you today. We thank you for the great report that you have given us, that we are free from the bondage of sin. Through your name, Father, through the baptism of the water and of the spirit, we have freedom, we have joy, we have power, and we have expectations, God. Use every person in this church. We are all ministers. We are all disciples. We all have a purpose that you want to fulfill through us. So God, we open ourselves up this day. We give you all the glory, all the praise, and we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Would everybody say, in Jesus' name.
up that voice, shout unto God. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want somebody to write this date down so you can look back and remember what I am fixing to say. But as we were singing that song and I was watching these young people and I was thinking about our Youth Congress, I felt a very strong impression. And I'll speak this to Brother Levi and current students. One bus is not gonna be enough. I literally saw two buses going down the road to Youth Congress because we are having revival. We've got young people reaching young people, bringing them to church, and I think we ought to praise God for that. And we who are older rejoice. We rejoice. Amen. God bless you. Give me a few moments to speak this morning, and uh, we'll let you go. You can return to your seats. You know, I was thinking about something crazy this week down at the camp meeting. One of the, one of the uh, pastors from South Louisiana brought us a watermelon. We put it in a refrigerator, and it was really good. How many like watermelon? We didn't eat it all. I don't know why. We put it in there and forgot about it. But anyway, when I was a kid, watermelon was a special treat. I mean, you didn't have a watermelon every day. And so mother and dad would get a watermelon, and it wouldn't fit in the refrigerator. So they had a big tub, and they put ice on it and get it all cold. And I remember we never ate it at the park, at this house. He always took us down to a little city park, and daddy cut the watermelon in big wedges and he gave all the boys one. Johnny didn't like watermelon. They'd always take him a ripe tomato and uh, we'd take our watermelon, our salt, you know, down there to the park and it, it uh, I always wonder, wonder why we went down to the park. We, I don't know. I was spitting those seeds out the other day and I spit a couple on the, on the recliner. I didn't tell my wife so I'd appreciate you not telling her about it. I got them up. I, I found them. They went down in the crack but I, I found them. But it dawned on me why Mother and Daddy always took us to the city park. Because you can just spit seeds everywhere, man. And they had a water hydrant down there, and so when you get through eating, and we'd always wind up in a fuss measuring who got the biggest slice. David always wanted to cut the heart out before Daddy starts slicing it up. Anyway, simplicity. Somebody say simplicity. It's been really hot this week, hasn't it? That means your electric bill is going to be high, right? 750 million people on the, in the world don't have electricity. So before you gripe paying that electric bill, be thankful. <laughs> be thankful. Boy, what a way to start out a sermon. Just very grateful, very grateful. I read this week that 57%, 57% of America's population cannot put their hands on $1,000 if they needed it for an emergency, 57%. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And it just reminds me of how blessed we are. And I, as I was thinking about the watermelons, I preached a sermon a while back called Simplicity, and I showed you a picture of the little little uh, horses that my dad made me and my brothers out of corn stalks. He made these shortly before he died. And just reminding us, that was the toy his daddy made him when he was a little boy. 
and that's what they played with. And uh, you, you, uh, you could do it remotely. They had a screen, and it had a lot of buttons on it, and you could run that little... Oh. I wonder if he had as much fun as you do today doing this, you know. I used to do that when there were four buttons. Now there's 12 buttons or something, and I gave it up. I'm like, no, mm -mm. I don't know what to do. I saw a lot of hunger last week. I've been seeing a lot of hunger from the people of God. The sermon, I want to be a disciple, or what it takes to be a disciple. I, uh, we were having this great altar service, no, no music, no nothing, just people coming and praying. It speaks of a hunger, of a hunger, of a hunger. And a hunger for God is the first symptom. It's the first sign that we're having revival. Amen. That's why the prodigal son got up and went home. He got hungry. He said, I'm perishing with hunger. And uh, it, was, it was really me. But I looked up as we were still going to baptize someone. It was 1 o'clock. Whew. In fact, one of, our, one of our young men sent out a text and was worried about something. Do you all have a picture of that text? Yeah, he was very concerned. <laughs> that made me laugh. I won't tell you who it is. So if you want to go to Panda Express... Today, I guess he's going to be there. So if, you, if you're dying to know who Jimbo is, you can go to, uh, oh, 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 no, oh, no. <laughs> we don't want Panda worrying about their faithful customer down there. That's a fact. Do you know, I was a young preacher. I was a young evangelist, and we were at a general conference, and one of my, one of the men that cast such a great vision, Brother J.T. Pugh, who was uh, at one time North American Missions Director, and he was at that time, and he made this statement, and he said, one day we're going to fill up football stadiums. Now, I'm a young man. I'm preaching in churches with 30 and 35 and 40 people. If they had 70, it was a big church. The buildings were not usually nice, and the songbooks were written in. You know, you could tell if families had rebellious kids because they wrote in songbooks. <laughs> I never wrote in a songbook because I would have become a songbook for my dad had I been caught. But he gave a, he, he made that statement, and I'm looking at all of these 33,600 apostolics registered and attended North American Youth Congress. And I'm thinking back, and guess where they had it? They had it in a football stadium. And I'm thinking back to that statement that a man of God, anointed man of God made and I'm thinking about revival, and I'm thinking about how these men believed what they said. They believed we had a gospel that would change the world. They believed it, that our message was a life-changing message. And I still believe that. I still believe that. 3,000 years ago, God gave a prescription for a nation in despair. It was written down in infallible, eternal ink. Are you listening? It was very simple. It was Second Chronicles 7 and 14. If, somebody shout if. Yeah. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If is the biggest two-letter word in the Bible. If 
appears 1,673 times in the English Standard Version, 1,588 times in the American Standard Version, and 1,670 times in the King James Version of the Bible. Jesus used the word if all the time. Almost half of the 574 occurrences in the New Testament are found in the four Gospels. And here's the deal. Jesus always put the if on the man's side. The if was never on God's side. It was always on man's side. It was simple, you go first. It's your turn. If you'll do this, I will do that. And God can back up what he says. Amen. 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 God can back up what he says. I'm going to tell you something about revival. Probably the greatest the greatest preacher most likely in America in the 1800s was Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody was in Chicago. He was the number one shoe salesman in Chicago, and he had a conversion experience with God. And he wanted to be a preacher, but his pastor didn't want him to be a preacher. He asked the pastor to reserve him five rows in that big church. And he said, I will fill those five rows up with people. And he went out with candy and he started bringing kids to church. It was the beginning of what we would call bus ministry. The only thing, their buses did not drip oil on the parking lot. They did leave something on the parking lot, but it was not oil. Come on, people. It was horse and buggy days, okay? <laughs> Amen. Not only did he fill those five rows up, he built a church with kids. He changed a generation of people. Soon, one day, he would travel across the country preaching. I, uh, I read some statistics, which can be very boring coming in a sermon, so I'll highlight them quickly. But... In our nation, in America, the greatest country in the world, watch this, the most blessed place in the world, the most prosperous nation in the world, one of the few places that still has a middle class, though it's shrinking a little bit every year. But in this great nation, $600 million are spent every day on mood-altering drugs. Some are legal, some are illegal. $67 billion spent on alcohol a year. $73 billion spent on nicotine. Pain relievers, $48 billion. Marijuana, 33 billion, cocaine, 17 billion, meth, 20 billion, heroin, 6 billion, tranquilizers and sedatives, these are bought on the street, $12 billion. As you can see, Americans love to get high. It's not that they want to be high as much as they want to escape. America needs revival. Amen. Amen. Major metropolitan areas in America have given up on the drug problem. They're now giving away the needles. And people by the hundreds of thousands are laying on the streets in cities that used to be beautiful cities. And we've got, well, I need to hasten on. Government is throwing money at this problem. For instance, a lot can happen in 60 seconds. You can throw a load of laundry in the wash machine, put away the dishes. But are you aware that drug users combined will spend over $525,000 in those few seconds? Here is a government throwing money, trying to help. We have a recipe. We have a prescription. Amen. If my people, who are his people? Peter said, 
You were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. It's not an exaggeration. Here are some more figures hard to believe. Amen. $525 million per minute are spent on trying to help people be free. Psychiatric drugs are administered to the tune to 76,940,000 people a year in America. 85,000 of those people who are getting mind-altering drugs are below the age of one. Can you fathom that? 17 and below, 6,280,000 needing help to get by in life. I'm not preaching against these. If you need them, we're going to let you take them until God sets you free. Right. Amen. 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 Praise God. And our government and many major news outlets specialize in peddling fear and hopelessness. CNN tweeted yesterday, it's time to stock up on tissues, bingeable TV options, and COVID-19 tests. Many signs are pointing to a COVID-19 summer surge. Wear a mask. No, don't wear a mask. Get a shot. Get two shots. Three shots. <laughs> Keep wearing your mask. I pass people off on the road or see them in the store. They're still wearing a mask. And I couldn't wear a mask very good. I couldn't breathe. They peddle anxiety and depression to keep us in a state of panic. This is not a political sermon today. This is a revival sermon. Amen. Because we have the answer. You know, used to, when you said somebody woke up, it simply mean they got up. I mean, you know, they, they, they woke up from their night's sleep. Or they took a nap. Well, he woke up. Well, now woke means men can have babies. Breastfeed. I read one article where they, several school districts took the urinals out of the boys' bathroom. I bet they didn't let the custodians vote on that. You know, we can laugh about this. This is the state of our nation. While 76 million Americans out of 340 million need some kind of mind-altering drug just to get by in this life. Where 57% of our people can't put their hand on $1,000. And this is our nation. Sane people who have a little sense are censored and shut down, moved out just like they shut out the prophets in the old days of Israel. They want to silence them. They want to muzzle their mouth. While Big Pharma raked in 82 billion last year, all the same time paying lobbyists half a million dollars to go to Washington and convince our politicians to vote against lowering drug prices when 57% of our people can't put their hand on $1,000. Amen. And they, they push all this climate change. They used to call it global warning till the earth got colder. I read, a, I read an article this week. I've been reading a lot this week. Artist blast brings new record cold to the United States. Coldest temperatures on record are hitting Asia. But all the time they peddle this fear and they peddle hopelessness and they try to create panic and anxiety to take our minds off of the corruption 
that they're peddling behind our back. You know what? I believe as the people of the Lord, we are going to be able, I mean, I can make a difference in the world. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. If you were here to hear Brad Thompson Wednesday night, you know the Pentecostals of Bossier City have a foreign policy, and we're not just making a difference in Bossier, but we're making a difference in the world. You ought to give the Lord a hand clap for that. I, I, was, I was astonished when, when uh, Tucker Carlson said, who, who, by the way, is probably was one of the most watched news people on the planet, said, I hadn't owned the TV in years. He, his, then he said, why would I want one? Well, that's a pretty good question, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. This is not political. I want to know where the prophets are, the men of God, the Dwight Moody's who say, give me five rows and I'll fill them up, who reaches out to the lost, the outcast, the downcast, the people who don't have a shot in this world, but they have a good chance of finding Jesus. And when they get Jesus, redemptive lift will come to their life. And then there'll be some changes taking place. Give the Lord a hand clap and I'll get off all those statistics, maybe. Amen. We're not here to keep people happy. We're here to have revival. We're here to reach the lost. We're here to help a sinner. We're here to help somebody that's on addiction, addicted. We're here to help those with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. That's why the church is here. The church is not here to keep me happy or to keep you happy and to put a goosebump on me every once in a while. The church is here to save sinners. Paul said, of whom I was chief, we're all sinners saved by the grace of God, and we need to thank God for that right now. Amen. One of the uh, phone companies, Verizon, I believe, wanted to rent the back half of our property here about maybe eight or nine months ago. In fact, the lady's been contacted me recently to put up a cell tower and they were gonna give us like $600 a month to put up a cell tower and he drew a diagram and they got these guide wires stretching out and it would take up half of the property back there. And he said, they've been calling me and they've been saying, are you interested? I, this happened way back. And so they approached me with an email the other day and I'm thinking, you know what? We're gonna need that land someday. It's a 25-year contract. They're the only ones that can get out of it for $600 a month. Are you kidding me? Now, when, when, when the big, uh, when the big, what they call that, a gas deal, that, what, what was that? What? Haynesville Shell, when they came to talk to us a long time ago, I said, I tell you what, you can put a well on the back of that property and we'll put a big sign up there, global missions reaching the world. <laughs> well, we missed out on that deal. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe it'll come back. I was at a doctor's office years ago. Are y'all listening to me? Okay, I was at a doctor's office quite a few years ago. I had tennis elbow, even though I don't play tennis. At least that's what he told me, I had tennis elbow. And so he, uh, we were talking, he found out who I was, and I was a pastor and blah, blah, blah. And so he said, he said, uh, I recently changed churches. He said, tell me about your church. And I said, what do you want to know about it? He said, if I came to visit your church, he said, what, 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 would I expect? I said, well, we're, we're very demonstrative. We sing loud, we clap loud. People run sometimes, we dance sometimes because we're in love with Jesus and he's listening to me. He said, sound like a calisthenics class. And I said, v very close, <laughs> very close. I said, why do you leave your church? He said, I'm gonna tell you why. I think all they're interested in down there is keeping the blue haired ladies happy. True story with my hand up. I didn't laugh out loud, I laughed under my breath. And I'm like, well, where are you going? He told me where he's going, it ain't a bit different. 
So since he left that one church, they've closed down. True story. I hadn't talked to him about it, but I went by there and the church is done. It's over, it's for sale. The church he went to embraces same-sex marriage. I don't know how he feels about that. I don't know if they have calisthenics. I think our world's ripe for revival. I, th I think even our community is open for a genuine demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Where are the prophets to sound the alarm? Where are the preachers who will wake up a sleeping church? Thank God we're not asleep. And let me tell you something about our senior citizens at the Pentecostals of Bossier. They rejoice. They rejoice when they see the young people thriving. They rejoice when our young people walk up to the front of this church and begin to worship God. They rejoice when they see them jumping up and down because they know that's our future. When they come up here playing guitars and singing like we heard this morning. Hey, everybody listen. That was Connor who grew up on these pews. They rejoice. They rejoice. And that's the way we ought to be. Everybody say amen. 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 50% of children will make a decision for Christ before the age of 10. 25% before their 18th birthday. 75% or 11% between the ages of 18 and 24. 8% between 25 and 34, or uh, 30, 34 and 45. 6% of people who made a commitment to God did so after they were at the age of 35. Now, why wouldn't we want our kids involved? Why wouldn't we want to spend money on kids? Why wouldn't we want to rent skating rinks and have a blast? Why? Why did we start Bozier Christian Academy? You know why? Because our chances of reaching kids are better when they're below that early age of 10 years old and then we got to reach them. We got to go get them. We got to save them. We want our kids saved. Amen. We want our kids saved. We want our people. This is not just about trying to keep the blue haired ladies happy. This is, this is about having revival. This is about a shout that's going up from 2833 Viking Drive that can make the earth ring. When they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the battle, the Bible said the shout that the earth rang again. That's the first time I've used that verse since I made my fantastic blunder many years ago. That that the earth rang again. That tells me it rang before. Do you know what I'm praying right now? There'll be a shout. Are you listening? There'll be a shout that'll go up from the Pentecostals of Bossier that'll make the earth ring again. You know what you ought to do right now? You know what we ought to do right now? We ought to shout until our shout is anointed. We yeah, we ought to shout until our shout is anointed by God. Come on, our nation's in trouble. Our city's in the middle of it. We, got, we don't have an option. We got to have revival. Somebody shout. Just shout. Just shout until your shout is anointed. Yeah. Yeah, I love that song, and it might get loud. Cause heaven's coming down, down, down. And it might get loud. I'm not talking about the PA. I'm talking about the dude sitting by you. Or the dame sitting by you. I love the second verse of that song. I guess it's the second verse. I don't have a halo. No, I'm not a perfect man. I'm just glad to be a child of God. Because where I th think of where I could have been, should have been, would have been, I got a praise on the inside. I don't even know the tune. But I can't be tonight and it might get loud. <laughs> I'm having more fun than anybody in the house right now because I believe revival is here. 
Come on, shout again until your shout is anointed. Come on, shout till your shout is anointed. Make the earth ring again. God, send men of God that'll shake us up, stir us up, move us up, draw us close to the cross, draw us close to Calvary. Amen? Amen. When I went and got my local license, one of the men on the district board was one of my Bible school instructors at Texas Bible College, and he taught a class called Personal Evangelism. And in the class, you had an assignment, you had all year to do it, was you had to go knock on 50 doors, give the address and the names of those 50 people. You had to get that to pass that class. Well, some of my friends got a phone book. (laughs) But I had too much of Holy Ghost to do that. But I went to meet the board and they were asking me questions and CLD said, Brother Dean, did you, did you fail any classes at Texas Bible College? I said, well, I got an incomplete in one of them. He said, whose class was that? I said, it was yours. <laughs> I said, Brother Dean, I didn't, I didn't turn in my 50 names. So they sent me out in the hall. I found out later they had a pretty good discussion about whether I would get a license. The only thing that saved my hide was I had been evangelizing for eight months already without a license. So when I went back in, our superintendent, whose name was V.A. Gidrose, who was an esteemed elder, stood about this far from my face. I could smell his coffee breath. I could feel his hot breath on my face, and he gave me a lecture while they almost didn't give me a license. Now, hindsight, If I was a district board member and I heard that, I'd probably vote no, don't give that boy a license. Didn't have enough gumption, played a lot of ball, played a lot of ping pong to go out and knock 50 doors and get a name and invite somebody to church. You know, wow, I'm fixing to get radical here. I'll quit in just a minute. I'm about done with just having revival in the church among believers. Is, any, is anybody else about done just having a church, a revival among the saints? <laughs> Boy, I had to say that. I just had to say that. <laughs> Amen. Where's Caleb and Lisa? Over our server, Lucy. Stand up, guys. I was talking to Caleb this week. I said, Where? They, they didn't get to have their community outreach two, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, because we had a flood. We had a downpour. And they had to cancel it. I said, he said, we're going to Jack's Quarters next, next year. He already got a building over there. How many of you know where Jack's Quarters is? <laughs> How many of you want to go with them? You know what? Jesus was teaching a lesson on pride. And for those of you that don't know, that's not the safest part of town. There's probably a lot of tinted windows on some suburbans over there. I'm just throwing that out. <laughs> God forgive me. Are we, we're online, aren't we? Jesus is teaching a lesson on, on humility and pride. And he talked about a man who threw a party, a banquet, okay? And he said, and and I found this out in my study, that in his day, if you were going to throw a big banquet, you would send out invitations in advance, long in advance. People didn't know when the party was. This had to be ready. And so that's what Jesus said, and it's in Luke 14 and 21, but... One, one guy came back and said, I bought a piece of ground 
I, I need to go check it out. Another man said, I bought five yoke of oxen. oxen. I want to try them out. Now, only a foolish man would buy a piece of ground without looking at it. Or who would buy oxen without first trying them out? I don't know. One guy said, I married a wife. I'm not going to be able to come. One commentary, not me, but one commentary said he's probably the only one that had a valid excuse. But... Go ahead and laugh. It's a, it's a kind of funny, really. It's kind of funny, and you'd make me feel better right now if you'd laugh. So go ahead and laugh. I'm not going to look up to see who's frowning at me right now. Amen. You know what? Jesus was teaching behind every excuse is a lack of desire. Now, just because those who were invited to the feast didn't come doesn't mean there's not going to be a feast. We may not have revival. There will be revival because it's prophesied in the last days. But we're going to get involved, right? Look what Jesus said in Luke 14. He said, that servant came and showed his Lord those things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring hither the poor. Somebody shout the poor. The maimed. Somebody shout the maimed. Somebody shout the halt and the blind and the servant said Lord it is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is still room and the Lord said unto the servant go out into the highways and edges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled for I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste my supper it appears to me like God's ready to go after everybody so he can have a full house he wanted the fishing nets to be full and he wants his house to be full so much that he said, go out and compel them. Somebody shout, compel. compel. Shout it loud. Compel. Shout it loud. Compel. Go out and compel them. You know what that word means in the original? Compel. That's your Bible study. It actually went on to say to constrain by force or threats. Amen? Go get them, if by any means. Amen? Let me say it again. We must be done with just having revival among the saints. But Steve's going up to plain dealing now. But Steve, I'm going to prophesy what you're doing on Wednesday night is the beginning of a church. I prophesied that. We got to get you some help. You may not want any. We got to get you some praise and worship. People are willing to do this. That's what happens when you have revival. Somebody shout amen. We need a deliverance ministry in the church. And I'm not just talking about devils. We need to be delivered from narcissism. We need to be delivered from ourselves. We need to be delivered from jealousy. We need to be delivered from backbiting. We need to be delivered in racism. We need to be delivered from complacency. I want the Pentecostals of Bossier to be the most integrated place in this city on Sunday morning. Jesus said, go compel them to come in. Who are we going to get? Everybody. Shout again until your shout is anointed. When I was on the Global Missions Board, I met with a group of pastors from Mexico and some Global Missions Board members in St. Louis at our world headquarters. And so I, I didn't know these people. I'd never met them. They couldn't speak English. And one pastor was there, and it, it, uh, Brother Hopkins told me that his mother church has uh, 1,200, that his daughter work has 800 people. They have church like all day on Sunday, just like Brother Dross when he was here. They have eight services a weekend. But anyway, I will never forget this man talking through and interpret. The musicians can get ready. We're getting ready to close. And this musician, I'm a musician, this, this uh, pastor down in Mexico said, he said, in America, you have what we don't have. 
We, we don't have good sound systems. We, we don't have good screens. We don't have good musical instruments. We don't, and he's going through all of this stuff. And I'm sitting here listening to the interpreter, but he said, in Me Mexico, we have something y'all need in America, revival. And I said, amen. And you ought to say amen. Let me tell you, you're, whatever you have to offer may make a difference in somebody's life. Stand up, Jessica. Stand up, Jessica. She came down here. Brother Rios was preaching. He said he wasn't taking an offering. I don't know. I don't know what brought Jessica to get up and come down here. I don't know. Maybe it was God. She'd been in our church about a, a year. She came in here without a place to live. She's living in a shelter. She's got two little old boys. She's getting, doing her best to get by, and of all people in the church, it was Jessica who came down here and threw some money in front of this pulpit. Jessica, you don't know what you did that day. There was about four to two hundred dollars in front of this pulpit. You do what you can do, and you let God do the rest. You do what you can do, and then you watch what God can do. He said, if you will, I will. And he's never changed it yet. Hey, where's Brother Clint? Sit down a minute. He said, he told me something this week that was so powerful. Stand up, I'm gonna embarrass you. He's a nurse. Now, he don't know I'm gonna tell this part. Quite a few months ago, he was singing up here and I sent him a text, man, I'm glad to see you on the platform. And he said, I had to get off the sidelines or something. He said, it's time to get involved and whatever. I don't know. But we've seen him kick it in. And we love it. Pastors love that. But anyway, he's a nurse. Everybody, if you didn't know, he's a nurse. I guess he's still working in ER. Yeah. And he's, so a man comes in and he's getting an IV in him. And the man asked him if he's a man of God. He said, my pain just left. True story. True story. And his wife said, he's been in pain. Brother Clint said, I went and looked at his chart to see if he was crazy. <laughs> and he wasn't crazy. God said, if you will. He didn't even ask to be for Clint to pray for him. He's just a man of God. Do you believe this can continue to happen? Yeah. Amen. We've got people in this church right now living in pain. We need deliverance. We need freedom. We need a deliverance ministry. When Brother Ryan read his text last night, when God sent out his disciples, he said, I give you power to cure diseases. Do we still believe it? If you believe it, stand to your feet and clap your hands and shout. Come on, shout till your shout is anointed. Get a hold of somebody by the hand right now. Get a hold of somebody by the hand right now and said, we will, Lord. If my people who are called by name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Somebody say, we will. We're gonna find that person that's bound up, trying to get high. We're gonna find them. We will. We will. And I'm gonna tell you, God said, if you will, then I will. So pray about it right now. Pray about it with your neighbor. I want you to pray God would show you what you need to do. Who can I help? I saw one of our young men, he didn't know I was watching, walked into Whataburger yesterday with a homeless guy with a cardboard sign. I watched him buy him a cheeseburger or something. And I'm like, God said, if you will, I will. If you will, I will. I'm gonna tell you who it is, he'd lose his blessing. When you give your arms to the poor, you don't tell anybody. He's just being what God called us to be, what God called us to do. If you will, I will. 
I want every young person from North America and you, Congress, I don't want you to lose that fire, that fervency. I don't want you to lose that shout. I don't want you to lose that anointing. I want you to take it to your schools. I'm telling you, you can be a Clint Walton. You can, you can make a difference just being in somebody's presence. That means ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? You want God to leave you alone? Or do you want to move out under the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost? We need a deliverance ministry. Pray about it right now. God, give us a deliverance ministry to set people free. I see two buses going to Youth Congress. I see a daughter work in plain dealing, reaching out to a community of hurting people. Hey, God will go after one. God will go after one. He proved it to us. He'll go after one. They're already doing it right here. Let's have a prayer meeting before we go home today. Let's have a prayer meeting before we go home today. They're already doing it. Who's coming? Somebody coming to pray? Amen. I want about five men around Brother Steve now. He has a burden for that community. He's been going to prison up there for years. We need a breakthrough. Somebody plays a guitar can go with him and leave the singing. Somebody. I'm done with having revival among the saints. Compel them. Compel them. Compel them. Compel them. Compel them. He's already found favor with the mayor. They're giving him a room. Let's go, Bozier. Let's go, Pentecostals. Let's go, Pentecostals. Deliverance ministry. Deliverance ministry. Deliverance ministry. He come a hash, I go. Two K on a Bahia. Woo! Yeah, bring that fire home. Bring that anointing home. Bring that. Bring that special anointing home. Spread it among us. Spread it among these pews. Spread it among these people. We're going to be your biggest fans and we're going to be patting you on the back and helping you doing what we can. Let you shout. 
shout be heard this morning. Let the earth ring again. Collins got somebody to baptize. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus, we're ready. We're ready. inside of you, just like Clint Walton. Didn't even pray for the man and God healed him in the ER. Think about that for a minute, would you? You got the Holy Ghost. I've got the Holy Ghost. It's powerful.
receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Shalom. 